Joining me now is best-selling author Douglas Murray, who this week was honoured by the Manhattan Institute with the Hamilton Award. Uh, congratulations, Douglas. Uh, let's talk about Kevin, though, Oscar winner Kevin Spacey, who has broken his silence to hit back at his accusers and the media hit pieces that have uh, destroyed his reputation. How much this has all cost you? I've lost my jobs. I've lost my house. I've got one foot in bankruptcy. Everything, as I've stated already. I would really just love to, you know, mm. be above all this and not have to talk about it, go back to my daily life, get back to work. But I have finally realized that if I don't fight back, this will never end. The Dan Wooten interview was uh, compelling. It's more than 90 minutes. But, Douglas, there is also a new documentary on Channel 4 called Spacey Unmasked, and it features allegations by 10 men, all pretty much making the same accusation that Spacey made unwanted advances towards them. And they say because of his high profile, they didn't feel they could complain. It's an extraordinary thing. The Channel 4 documentary, as I understand it, was, was commissioned before the trials that Kevin Spacey was put through in the US and UK. And, of course, he was exonerated in both those cases because there was, there was nothing to them. Uh, he was found not guilty in, in two countries. Channel 4 seemed to have put so much money into the documentary they were hoping would, would, would reveal Kevin Spacey that, that when he was found not guilty and acquitted, uh, it's obviously bothered Channel 4. So they pushed ahead anyway with a, a set of other accusers whose complaints are extraordinary. And extraordinary not because they're extraordinarily serious, but because, first of all, they go back, one of them goes back 50 years almost. Now, I mean, mm, if anyone can yeah. say what they think they were doing 50 years ago, uh, I challenge them to it. Um, but every single one of the allegations, there's about, I think, nine or ten of them, are people saying things like, he stroked my thigh once uh, uh, when, you know, when our, we were working together. Now, you know, as I say in The Spectator this week, uh, the interesting thing that's gone on in the post-Me Too era is that there are things that, uh, that cannot be said uh, because they involve men and women. And we all know what incredibly dangerous train it is for any man to say anything about a woman these days. But when you take the women out of the equation, as with the Casey space, because this is about me men making an accusation against another man, you actually get to a truth of something which I find very interesting. One of the accusers in this Channel 4 documentary uh, um, says that it's, which seems, because Channel 4 tried to make it as difficult as possible for Spacey and his representatives to actually uh, work out who these accusers are or, or understand when they happened and much more. Um, it, one of the uh, um, accusers seems to have sort of gone on a s number of dates with Kevin Spacey, or at least met him socially mm. on a number of occasions one-on-one, -on -one, and, and uh, says that there was some flirting and he didn't like that. Uh, but then he sort of went on another date now, I have to say, that would seem to me to fall in the category of leading someone off. And then it, and, and several of the people said things like, I, thought, I, I think that because of his power as a theatre director and a Hollywood actor, um, I, that, that he dangled uh, uh, promises in front of me for my career, because some of these people seem to be people who are aspiring actors. But here's the thing, Rita. Uh, um, as, as everybody knows, but it becomes able to be said in a male-male context, who was leading who on here? Now, Spacey denies all of these, these new allegations as he has the other ones. But I find it very interesting. Who has the power dynamic if, for instance, it's a younger male wanting to make his way in the film industry who might well decide mm. that he wants to lead on the older, then closeted gay actor and make their own way up the acting profession for it. There's a reason why Hollywood is the place where the term casting couch was invented. And it's because throughout the history of Hollywood, there have been younger men and women who have actually wanted to get up in their profession the fast way, as they think of it. Actually, it's not the fast way. The best way, the fastest way is just sheer talent. But I think the dreadful thing about all of this is, and the Dan Wharton interview, is it shows once again that we live in this era where things that are not illegal get complained about, get blown up by 
dishonest media like Channel 4 on this occasion. And actually, all of it is tittle-tattle. And in the midst of it, one of the great actors of our time wants to work. I would suggest instead of Channel 4 wanting to spread more tittle-tattle about him, which no one wants to watch, how about commissioning him to be in a film which everyone would want to watch? You make some excellent points there. I think the fact that Kevin Spacey was for so long in the closet, that adds a new uh, layer to this story because he had this fear of being exposed for, for so many yeah. years and that, that is something, a power, a lot of his accusers had. They, they could have uh, uh, blown yeah. his, his cover story um, and in the end he came out in the most... Uh, bizarre of circumstances after these accusations that had aired. He concedes that in the interview. He said that the way in which he came out of the closet was a disaster. I mean, he, he concedes that, you know. But but we live in a strange time, by the way, Rita, don't we? Because the old thing used to be, you know, sort of apologise uh, for anything you've done wrong. He apologised for something he hadn't done, and then his life was torn apart. <laughs> Yes. Uh, now, I've got to praise you again, Douglas, because you have written a fantastic column for morons, for the college kids uh, cosplaying, uh, being part of some sort of a terror cell on campus, uh, chanting for intifada. Uh, you've been very good to educate them about what precisely an intifada means, but I wonder, Douglas, whether they actually know what it means. They are... Uh, aware of its full meaning and they're chanting it anyway. Many of them have said in recent months, decolonisation by any means necessary. It's extraordinary, isn't it, Rita? I mean, you effectively see once again something you and I have talked about in a number of contexts, which is, which is people who must either be sinister or silly. The sinister ones know what they're talking about when they chant for intifada. The silly ones are chanting a slogan they clearly don't understand. So, so let me let me speak to the second ones for a moment, as I tried to in this article. Um, if you call for intifada, uh, you should know what an intifada is. There was an intifada when I was growing up in the uh, in the late nineties. There was one uh, in the earlier nineties, but. The, the second intifada included uh, uh, suicide bombings against uh, Israelis of the most gruesome type. Uh, I mentioned in that piece the 2001 bombing of the Dolphinarium nightclub in Tel Aviv, where a, a Palestinian suicide bomber detonated by a group of young women trying to get into the club. Um, these, these women are the same age, were the same age, as these women chanting for intifada now at Columbia and in LA and in other uh, reprehensible educational institutions in the US. I wonder if, the, if these students know that a suicide bomber went into the cafeteria of a university in Jerusalem uh, in that same period and blew up and murdered, uh, among other things, American students who were trying to have a cup of coffee in the middle of their studies. I wonder if these disgusting and ignorant kids, kids at American universities have any idea that that's what they're calling for. And if they do, then they are morally lost to an extent that they probably could never come back from. But if they're just ignorant, which I really, really hope they are, I hope that to steal one of the phrases they're so keen on using themselves, they do the work and realise what the words they chant actually mean. Well, uh, that's that's the, the question, and I do really worry that so many of them do have an understanding of what they're chanting for, because uh, some of the justifications, the mad ra rationalisations we've heard in recent months uh, uh, send a chill up your spine. And we're seeing some uh, craziness also from media folk who should know better. Even much of the left uh, sees the absurdity of the LGBT groups for Palestine. Uh, I mean, they understand how ludicrous that is. But apparently that's lost on the Washington Post's Taylor Lorenz. Many of the people in these marginalized groups, obviously they are fighting for um, Palestine, right, for the Palestinians and for what's happening in Gaza. But yet in Gaza, they would not have any freedom. You know, <laughs> they don't have freedom.
victims in Texas and Florida. Does that mean? But they don't. But I, I understand that. But Taylor. Texas? Oh, my gosh, Douglas. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly what rights gay people don't have in, in Texas and Florida, but even Don Lemon had to step in to uh, bring some sanity to that discussion. Taylor Lorenz, Lorenz is a complete airhead, uh, no nothing. She's not a journalist, never has been. And uh, unfortunately, the Washington Post has given her a birth of a kind where she um, does totally unimportant work and sort of just gibbers away about obsessions of her own. But, you know, that, what she just said there, is again a demonstration of a completely lost person, a morally lost person. She's so desperate to make her points such as she can about the Palestinians or Gaza that she honestly wants to, to not just deny what is happening in Gaza in, and in the Palestinian areas towards uh, gay people and, and indeed all minorities. She has to find a way to, to get away from that unfortunate problem that the people she's essentially on the side of, Hamas, she's downplaying what they do, they, that they throw gay people off buildings and so on. She's downplaying that by mm -hmm. saying, well, it's the same in Texas. You know, I'm pretty sure, I've been a fair amount to Texas, I love the great state of Texas, I'm pretty sure you can't just throw gays off buildings there. Uh, and I'm certain mm -hmm. that if anyone tried it, uh, uh, they would be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And because I actually also throwing people off buildings is as a whole in its entirety illegal in the state of Texas. And uh, not just the gays, you can't throw anyone off a building in Texas. So if Taylor Lorenz honestly wants to defend her apparently friends in Hamas to, to such an extent, she should realize that she should really find a new way of doing so because all she's done here is tried to ignore the crimes of Hamas and actually smear uh, the state of Texas, among others. And uh, so, well, anyway, good luck to her with whatever grift she's got coming next. But it's a great shame because the Washington Post used to be a fine paper and, and used to employ and still does employ some very good journalists. So they must be so embarrassed to have Lorenz among their midst. Well, yeah, Washington Post isn't what it used to be. And before the Washington Post, she was at the New York Times. So she's been at some uh, major publications, but that's the thinking right there. Let's talk a little bit about men-only clubs. The Garrick Club has succumbed to pressure and voted to allow women to become members for the first time in its 190-year history, Douglas. This is a famed club uh, it's said to be bitterly split on this issue, though. Uh, BBC World Affairs editor John Simpson last week tweeted that various Garrett Club members, including musicians Sting and Mark Knopfler and leading actors and producers, have reportedly uh, written to the chairman saying they'll resign if the membership doesn't vote to accept women next Tuesday. That vote's taken place and women will be accepted. What's your take on this, Douglas? Is this fair enough that in 2024 we shouldn't have segregated spaces or should men and women, if they opt to, be able to just be amongst their own and, uh, I don't know, have some peace? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, first of all, isn't it hilarious, Rita? The Guardian, you know, really at the forefront of the issues of our day. None of us will be free until everyone can join the Garrick Club uh, <laughs> and, until they discover that it's an exclusive club that it takes years of waiting to be a member and you have to be recommended by people who are already members. It's so ludicrous. It's such a sort of niche, ridiculously elite sort of argument that these people like The Guardian obsess about. I love uh, uh, John Simpson and uh, Stephen Fry and these other celebrities. They joined an all-male club. I mean, they joined an all-male mm. club and now they're saying, unless we accept women after my 50 years of membership, I've just discovered that there are no women members in the club. It's appalling. I, I don't know how observant these people are. Um, uh, it's, it's so ridiculous. I mean, uh, my view is that uh, if women want to join an all-women's club and men want to join an all-men's club, and uh, by the way, women can come to the Garrick as guests if they want to and so on, it's not a big deal. Uh, there are some people going on about segregated spaces and so on. Well, I've got a challenge for them, and indeed a challenge for The Guardian. Um, 
if you're worried about sex segregated spaces, why don't you go to mosques up and down the United Kingdom and elsewhere and find rooms that women, Rita, are not allowed to go into? And this is a much bigger scale than the Garrick Club. The Garrick Club has quite a large membership, but I bet it's not the same membership as all of the mosques in the UK. And then they should go and they should make sure that every one of these male-only areas in mosques are having women introduced to them. So good luck to The Guardian. Good luck to John Simpson, Stephen Fry, and the rest of them in the next step of your great crusade. After the Garrick, go for all of the mosques in the UK. And good luck, guys. You're going to need it.